let's get started. Thanks for joining us, guys. My name is David. I am the Australian Community Manager for Decred. Uh, for those of us who've been on these before, welcome back. For those of you who are new to our online virtual meetups, welcome for the first time. Um, today, we're going to get in depth. Uh, with on-chain analysis for Decred and Bitcoin with Checkmate. Um, if you've ever heard Checkmate before, you know he gets right into it and I don't feel as though we're going to be disappointed today. Uh, so without I'll give my best friend to uh, disappoint. <laughs> um, one thing I will say before we continue is that um, I request that everyone remains on mute other than uh, Checkmate so that uh, he can present and we can um, accept questions using the chat feature of Zoom. Uh, and if you post your chat questions to everyone, uh, Checkmate will see them um, and I'll see them as well in case we need to remind of those questions. Uh, and in the interim, if you do unmute yourself, I will probably mute you <laughs> as host. Uh, and finally, the disclaimer that I have to say, obligatory disclaimer is none of this is financial advice. Please do your own research. Uh, all of this is just our own understanding and opinion. And this session will be recorded. So if you are concerned about uh, being published online, you can be very careful about what you contribute to this session. Thank you very much, Checkmate. Over to you, sir. Thanks, David. So, uh, yeah, look, for those who don't know, I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, I'm, a, I'm just a dude on the internet, but my focus has always been um, on-chain analysis. So kind of fell down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and uh, in the last year, the Decred rabbit hole. And to be honest, I've never crawled out of either of them. And the thing that really excites me the most about this space is what you get to see on-chain because, I mean, th these networks give you their you know, their 401k and their, their full full report on what's going on every block. What I'll kind of do today is we've, we've obviously just had the Bitcoin halving. And I think the, the previous one of these sessions we had would have been just before or uh, pretty, pretty close to the halving. Um, so I'll run through a little bit about what I see uh, going on, just, just high level, particularly on the mining front for, for Bitcoin, because I think that's probably where people have the most interest. Um, and then I'll touch on two things for Decred, which I think are pretty cool. One is the majority attack calculator that was released on the Explorer recently. Um, and then I'll also touch on, so this morning I released uh, my latest paper, which is looking at the realized cap and the MVRV ratio, um, as well as a handful of new indicators, which to be honest, even I was surprised by the level of conviction and signal these things have. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of run through those and it's a nice uh, kind of launch pad for that, that paper. I've got these two charts that I've mapped out. This one here in particular is basically Bitcoin since what we're calling the capitulation or the low point, right, of each of the different market cycles. In the dark blue, we've got the, you know, the, the old school rally back in 2009, 2012. Um, in red, we've got the rally that went up to 2017. And then here we are in the light blue. Um, and I've got another one which is similar, which is basically saying from the market top, um, where have we, we, we progressed to? And I like to use these two models. So this one here from the cycle low, because it kind of gives you an idea about in terms of growth multiple. So on the Y axis, we've basically got um, how much it's grown since that low as a, you know, if you, if you invested on the very bottom, um, what your, uh, your gains would be in, in a, you know, how many multiples you've got. And you can see that in the light blue, we're pretty much, you know, in, in the early part of this rally, we had that, that move up to 14K. Um, and we basically followed the trajectory of, and I think Willie Wu was talking about this, um, it was a very, very fast, very quick, um, expedited rally. And you can see it's actually kind of in line with the, the old school rally back in 2009, 2010. Um, and since that point, we've basically been sideways to down and volatile, right? So we've kind of been trading sideways. And interestingly, we've now tracked onto the path of the, um, uh, the 2012 or 25th, post 2015 cycle. So, um, you know, it, it's quite interesting that we've, we've actually traversed both of these paths. But in terms of progress in, uh, you know, let, let's assume that Bitcoin goes to the moon like we all want it to. Um, we're kind of following in, in, in previous cycles footsteps and you know there's a lot of people who will expect this thing to actually extend out and we could get a, a much longer cycle time um, but we're kind of treading previous ground here which is you know, in my mind it, it, it kind of gives me a bit of a roadmap and we're not anywhere outside uh, what we've seen previously 
Um, now, the other interesting part of this is that we're seeing, so back in the early days, when you're going from, you know, six cents to 12 bucks, it's a huge move, right, in percentage gain terms. Um, difference is not many people were sitting on that particular rally. Um, and you can see that the, the high points are actually coming down. So back in the early days, we we're talking about 500x gains, talking about 100x from the previous cycle. It wouldn't surprise me if we come somewhere down near this 10, 20. You know, I would expect that as the market gets larger and size starts to creep in, um, these will start to come down. Things will start to, you know, you need more volume to sustain these higher prices and, uh, and things like that. So, um, you know, I can kind of see a, it could be a longer cycle. It could be that we actually, if we expect the four year halving cycle, you know, it does go boom bust every four years. Um, maybe we're on track to, to progress along the, this red line like previous cycles. Um, or it could be that we have a much longer and, you know, this could take eight years. We could get two halvings. Now that the halvings aren't having that much of an impact um, on a percentage term, um, you know, we're not going from 50 to 25, we're going from, you know, 12 and a half to 6.25 and then it's, you know, three point whatever. So it could be that we get these elongated cycles over time. You need more volume to sustain higher prices, all that kind of stuff. So um, it just kind of gives me an idea about where we are. We kind of tracked the early days. Then we've had this long, big pullback. It could be that we track a little bit of this brown line and then we track back down and we have these, you know, more of these miniature bull bear, bull bear, bull bear through these, um, th this market cycle could be what happens, right? As, as we get larger. And likewise, when we're looking at it from the market top, um, it's very interesting that we actually, you know, this, if you want to look at the bear market, um, this red dashed line is basically showing once you hit all time high, time to all time high. Um, you can see the earlier cycle, we did it in 600 days. Um, in the, uh, the last cycle that we went through, uh, the 2015 cycle, it basically took us um, 1200 days, so it doubled that. Um, it could be that in this particular rally, we may not, you know, if it follows Brown, we'll be attacking uh, all time high by, you know, this time next year. Um, it could be that we actually trade sideways and volatile for quite some time. And it could be that we're actually attacking it out here at 1800 days, right? So we could be in a sideways and volatile range for, you know, the next two, three years. Um, obviously, there's a lot of uh, macroeconomic side to this, right? You, if, if you're not bullish on Bitcoin when they're printing trillions of dollars, you probably won't ever be. So, you know, it, it's going to be very interesting to see how we track these. But overall, um, we're more or less following previous cycle times. Uh, so it's, it kind of, you know, it gives you a bit of a roadmap on where we are on that front. Now, from the, let me just make sure everything's recording. Yeah. Um, from the miners perspective, um, you know, we've had the halving and if we zoom up here, you can actually see so this is the difficulty ribbon, which is just basically a, a series of moving averages of protocol difficulty. Now, anyone who follows moving averages would know that, you know, your 200 day moving averages are much slower. You need a lot more time for it to react and turn around. Whereas your faster, um, you know, uh, nine day moving average is much quicker and obviously follows the, the actual metric much faster. Um, and you can see that post halvings, um, we actually do get, we generally do get, you know, the original halving was uh, in, in this zone here. You get a flattening as that reward. There's not as much incentive for miners to come on board. Um, likewise, we had a, uh, you know, a, a slight plateau through here. And you can see that we've just had a halving and we're starting to get that little curl down, right? Just a little bit of a curl down in the, um, in the difficulty ribbon. I'm not expecting a great deal of new mining companies to come in on this thing. Um, you can see that because of this slow, kind of slow growth. And again, we're up in high multiples here, but um, it's clearly had some impact. Um, it's quite impressive that price has held the way that it has. Um, this dark blue line that you can see here, um, for those of you who know Plan B's model where he's done his linear regression of stock to flow and, and bits like that, this is a similar type analysis that I've done, which Hans Haig actually did originally, um, that I've kind of modified in my own code. And what this is doing is if we assume that miners and the amount of, you know, the, the amount that the difficulty goes up is correlated to price, which it should be, right? The more the price goes up, the more miners can be sustained. Um, no one's going to burn money. Everyone's going to be profitable. So, you know, difficulty will go up and down according to the price level and whether it can be sustained. Um, and what I really like about this, like I just call it the difficulty multiple. And you can see this guy here is, is literally plotting that. Um, I really like the difficulty multiple and to be perfectly honest, I like it a lot more predicting what I would call, you know, fair price than anything else. 
um, because it's baking in the core fundamental feature of minor income, minor cell pressure, ASIC hardware, power, all that stuff is reflected in one beautiful little metric, which is the difficulty, right? Everything else, you see all these models talking about, you know, let's predict based on power and let's look at machines and all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's, it's you know, it's super valuable information. But at the end of the day, the same way that the market distills everything into price, um, the mining industry is distilled into one metric, difficulty. And if we assume that they're correlated, you can take this linear regression. And what you can see actually is if we zoom in, um, we are pretty much dead on the mining difficulty price, right? So based on the mining hub, when you can see we're getting a slight dip in this, but you know, um, based on the mining industry metrics, um, it values Bitcoin about $159 billion and we're currently at 179 billion. So, you know, more or less dead on. So um, this is kind of, this is telling me that miners are not in extreme stress, but they're also not, you know, they're not liquidating their treasuries on mass, but they're also not necessarily um, running at gross heinous profits like we had back here, right? Um, so it, it's kind of an interesting metric just to, to track that kind of thing. But um, there's a little bit of stress in the uh, in the mining industry, but nothing extreme. The vast majority of miners by this point in their, in their business are, um, are well equipped to deal with this. It's not like the halving was a surprise. Um, and let me just quickly, run I think I'll have the pure multiple here somewhere this guy here I thought I ran this before um so the pure multiple is basically a ratio of the current minor income um to the 365 day moving average of minor income um and that it basically produces this oscillator and because miners are long-term thinkers um what was very interesting about this particular halving so the previous halving you can see here um this was the halving one halving two and then halving three has just occurred here. Now, what's really, really interesting about this, let me just zoom in, is you can see that the previous halvings didn't drop this guy here, this guy here, they did not drop it down into the red zone, which is kind of the, you know, the, the buy zone counterintuitively. Um, but that's kind of the zone where miners are under fairly substantial stress. Now, with mining, um, the, the notion of minor stress is commonly misunderstood. Um, the way I frame it in my mind is when miners are under stress, it's short-term bearish, long-term bullish. And the mechanics behind that is that when you've got a, a, you know, this stress in the mining industry, you know, rewards have halved over here. This has been particularly special because we halved price, right? It recovered and then we halved the BTC reward. So the miners got slapped with two, two halvings um, within a, a month of each other. Now, when miners are under stress, the weak miners, those who are overcapitalized, who have debt levels that are too high, or just you know didn't buy the right hardware at the right time, or just got unlucky and got flooded, or something like that, um, they all have some kind of treasury of BTC that they mine, right? They 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 don't want to sell all, but some of them do. But for the most part, miners are investing in ASICs. They're long-term thinkers. They have to be, and. Um, they will be liquid, the weak miners will liquidate their treasuries, right? In order to pay their costs. They've still got US denominated costs. They must pay those and, and, and uh, you know, tend to those debts. Now, if a weak miner takes all of their machines off, right? And they flog them on the internet, they get out of, out of the business. Um, whoever is still in the game, there's a set reward pool, right? Of 6.25 BTC per block. And every single miner is competing for a share in that particular reward. Now, if a bunch of your competition disappear off the map, you're now gaining a larger share of that pool. Your hash share goes up and therefore your reward share goes up. And if your costs remain the same and you keep plugging away doing exactly what you're doing or you even expand, it's very possible that you can actually hold on to more coins and sell less. So this is why I say it's short term bearish because the, the weak miners have got to capitulate and exit. And that is a sell pressure but long-term bullish because the strong miners are now selling less coin and they can start hanging on to it for longer, which actually constrains the supply because they're long-term bullish as well, right? They're more bullish than you and I, that's for sure, because they bought all these ASICs. So that's what I mean where it's, you know, minor stress is actually a positive thing. And we'll get to this when it comes to, uh, to decred because we've obviously had a lot of minor stress of late um, and we're starting to see exactly what I want to see, which is the uptick in the difficulty ribbon. So. Um, anyway, that's kind of where I'm seeing BTC at the moment. It's very impressive that price has held the way it is. I think the macroeconomic environment is it's responding to Fed announcements um, as everything else in the world seems to be doing. Um, there's no fundamentals left in the world except for what Jay Powell says. Um, but outside that, you know, things are 
looking very positive for hard assets. And we're seeing more and more, even though we had that Goldman Sachs global call, um, where they were talking about, you know, uh, monetary policy, gold and Bitcoin, and they had a slide of 2012 FUD on, uh, on why Bitcoin is always doomed. The fact that they put it in the same slide is actually what matters here, right? Um, could you ever imagine that Bitcoin was going to be in a global Goldman Sachs call? I don't think so. So we are slowly breaking down the walls. And the more times that it gets said next to gold, the more it actually attains that status. So you, um, to be honest, you couldn't really be more bullish on, uh, on the macro environment and where this is headed, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, so while we're kind of on this, let me just see if I can find my difficulty metric. Here we are. So now that we've kind of gone through minor stress, that, that I'm, I'm pretty bullish. I think miners have, um, I don't see as much stress as what people thought they were. I think miners are much more professional and prepared. Um, I don't see any, uh, um, as we saw in those roadmaps, so I can kind of see it going sideways and volatile. I'm not expecting it to blow through all time high in the next three months. It could do, but um, we're kind of treading past ground. If we expect longer cycles, um, you know, and, and miners are not exactly dumping things or, you know, we're not extremely overvalued or undervalued. We're kind of just in middle ground. So um, I'm kind of anticipating sideways movement. Um, for Decred, what I'm really excited about is what's going on um, kind of across the board, actually. But Nino and I have been talking a lot about um, the, the capitulation that we've seen of late. And, you know, when you look at this thing here, we, we've had this initial sell-off in December. We had a little rally. It then dumped again back in October. We tried again, and then it just had this final puke out. And this puke here, um, you know, the coronavirus sell-off, um, it had all the hallmarks of a capitulation. We had selling on the miners side. We had selling on the stakeholder side. Ticket price was falling down. Miners were falling down. Like, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, but there's some really, really nice green grass shoots coming out the back of it. And if we look at this from a fractals perspective, let's just get rid of difficulty for now. So these markers that we've got here, um, these colorations through here is um, the block subsidy model that Pernville Nino developed. And this is basically just summing up all the USD rewards um, paid to the treasury, um, to proof of stake, to miners, which is very important, and total, right? So this is kind of the cash flow of the Decred network. How much is it issued in US dollars um, compared to the market cap? And you can see back in the end, granted, this is in the early days, right? But we had this initial sell-off, which dipped below the proof of work line. And the proof of work line is more or less where we're getting, um, that is the aggregate payment for miners. We can, we're not, the protocol's not paying any more than that and no one wants to burn money. And you can see that we had a rapid repricing um, as it basically you know, commenced the, uh, the, the bull run back in 2017. But this stress line down through here was indicating that the price had fallen enough that it was, it was barely profitable. And you know, again, Degrad's pretty small back here. Um, you can see that in this bear market, we tested it once, right? It had traded sideways, bounced back above the total line, tested it again. At this point, miners are starting to have a bit of a bit of a challenging, uh, challenging run, right? They, the ASICs kind of launched up in 2018, and they've pretty much seen a bear market ever since. So it's been very hard for them to recuperate their uh, their, um, their their investment. So it's been very challenging for, for them. And then we finally capitulated below that proof of work line. So now miners are most definitely operating at a loss down in this zone. Now, if we turn on all of our metrics now with the difficulty ribbon, you can see that during that same period of time when we're below the cash flow line, we had a horizontal difficulty, right? Which is saying that there's stress in the market. Asics went live here and you can see this exponential increase in hash power, even though price was heading in the opposite direction. So this is, this is how we actually, you know, we know that ASICs went live there because we're talking about massive increases over very short periods of time um, and only price going down. So the only thing that can cause the hash rate to go up, even though there's not enough, as many rewards, is that the hardware got more efficient, right? So that's, that's that other layer to this thing. Now, since, what is this, October? So since this sell-off in October, um, which was pretty grim for uh, for miners. That's where we started to get our difficulty squeeze, right? So we're starting to get this. Um, the actual difficulty is below all of the long-term moving averages. Um, and it's basically been squeezing ever since October 2019, right the way through to May. Now, as of May, we've broken above the cash flow line, right, for proof-of-work miners. And the difficulty ribbon is starting to expand. This is really, really exciting to me. We're starting to see hash rate ticking up. It means miners are under less stress. 
um, even though they've endured some challenging financial circumstances, they've already sunk the cost on the ASICs. So really what their cost basis is at this point, I mean, they may be hurting in terms of capital um, flows, but um, when you're seeing difficulty squeeze, it means that it's really squeezing. It's getting down to the power bill, right? Because you may as well run the ASIC you've already spent the money on until it's just consuming more power than your income, right? And then you start to turn them off. So this difficulty squeeze and the length of it is actually very good because it means that coins have been distributed. Now, one thing that I've noticed about Decred is overall it's had a hard go. It's generally existed in a bear market and that's actually long-term bullish. Short-term bear, long-term bullish because Decred's, the, the important part about Decred is the distribution of coins. Now, um, Richard Red just released a article, which I absolutely encourage everybody to read. It's, it's one of the best pieces I've seen in a long time. He's gone through and actually tracked not only miners, but contractors, um, and just looked at on aggregate, where are the coins going? Because um, there's a lot of people who, you know, you look at this bear market and you, you like to come up with a bit of FUD and say, oh, you know, contractors are dumping on us or blah, blah, blah. And, you know, basically Richard went through and, and put some actual numbers to this thing and tracked what happens with coins. And the vast majority of contractor coins get either unspent, right? So they're just sitting there. They got paid out and they're sitting there in a wallet not being spent um, or uh, staked, right? So they're long term. They're not, there's, I think it was like 25% head to an exchange. Um, granted, it's within three hops, they could happen later, but um, in general, contractors are not dumping, they're actually long-term bullish holders. And what he actually saw is that miners are actually the ones who are selling, which is kind of the, the most logical conclusion here, right? It makes sense that miners would be selling because they've got um, hardware, capital, and power costs, unforgeable costliness, right? So that's actually really, really positive. It means that those coins, I mean, Decred's absorbed a hell of a lot of sell pressure, but it's put it in a very good position in distributing those coins as widely as possible. So same way as it is with Bitcoin, short-term bearish, long-term bullish. In my eyes, I really like this curling up of the difficulty ribbon. This, this excites me a lot. Um, as sad as that and nerdy as that may sound, I think this is really, really positive. And um, it's, it's a validation that, you know, um, Nino's uh, block subsidy models, uh, they work very well. And what's amazing about on-chain analysis is that it picks up all of this psychology that's going on. Um, that it's it's just kind of, it just kind of is right. This is just people interacting with a network, be it investors, mining, whatever it is. All of this this aggregate complex behavior gets distilled into simple metrics, and these block subsidy models quite clearly are picking up when miners are in stress because we're seeing it across two different metrics. So that just kind of gives you a snapshot as to why on-chain is, uh, is, is very cool and uh, why you can actually find a lot of edge in just understanding what's going on with the market uh, based on that. Um, so that's kind of what's going on on that front. And, um, you know, what, when we look at the actual attack, let me go to the, the attack cost, which is kind of related. Um, for those of you who haven't played around with this thing, it's, it, it's actually pretty nifty. It's based on a paper that um, uh, Brian Stafford put together, uh, who's currently working on the DEX, um, was kind of the backbone of this. And then the, uh, the radar group has basically gone through and built this um, majority attack cost calculator. Um, and what this does, I mean, I, I've, I've built some of this code in the, uh, in the background, which I used for my unforgeable costliness paper. Um, but this is, a, this is a really, really great public resource. Now, the notion of how this works is in order to attack Decred, let me find my security curve. Now, in order to attack, you need to overcome two different um, logistical hurdles. The first one is you need to have enough hash power and you need to have enough tickets because every block that, the, that you do proof of work on needs to be proposed and you then need to win three out of five tickets. Now, if you only had 20% of the ticket pool, right? That means that one in five tickets is get, um, on average, one in five of those five that get selected are gonna be yours, which means your block's never gonna get passed and you're gonna have to mine a block, propose it, reject it. Mine it again, propose it, reject it. Now, if you wanna keep up with the honest chain, which is um, uh, winning all of those blocks, right? It's building a longer chain at the same time. If one in five of your blocks is being rejected, you need to be mining orders of magnitude faster to be producing blocks five times as fast, right? And it's actually more than that because if you've got one in five tickets, what are the actual, what's the actual chance that you're gonna get three out of those five? It's actually very low. And that's why you end up with this exponential security curve. So on the X axis, what we've got is the attacker's share of tickets. So whether they've got 30% of the tickets, 45, 15, 10, 
And this orange line to the left axis is how many multiples of the honest hash power do you need? So if we take the most intuitive case, let's just say that an attacker has 50% of all of the tickets, right? And these are already in the, in the, in the pool that they need to have an attack multiple of one, right? Which means they need to literally 51% attack. So they need to have 50% of the tickets and 51% attack. Now, if we drop that even marginally to say 40%, right? So now they have 40% of the tickets. They now need 2.15 times the honest hash power, which means if the current hash power is 500 peta hash, you need 500, 1,000, and then plus 15. So you need, uh, you know, 2,500 peta hash to actually combat that, right? Um, oh, sorry, I think it'd be 1,150 anyway. Um, 2.15 times the honest hash. And the less tickets you have, the further up this exponential curve you go. I mean, once you're at 30% of the tickets, you're talking about five times. So you need five times all the decred ASICs. To, this is not even to um, reorg the chain. This is just to match the honest hash power, right? This is so you're building a chain as fast. And it doesn't include anything to do with, you know, stakeholders buying more tickets or more miners switching on to defend. It doesn't include any of the logistical constraints here. Um, and this is why you get this exponential security curve, right? It's, it's just orders of magnitude um, greater than pure proof of work. Um, and I basically could tail this thing down at 75 because at 75%, you've got enough tickets to overwhelm the entire pool. Now, what's really, really nifty about this particular um, attack cost calculator is you can punch in. So it's got, you know, which um, ASIC device do you want to consider? Um, and you can think about that in terms of how much, you know, actual hash power, um, you know, if you want to buy the devices, how many do you need to, to actually attack it? Um, you, can, you can put in everything from electricity cost, what the exchange rate is, if you want to do a 30% proof of stake attack. Um, and you're getting, you know, 90, uh, 90 million, is that 90 million? Yeah, $90 million for a one hour, let's go one hour, $90 million for a one hour reorg. Um, or, or to attack the chain for one hour, which is substantial. It's very, very, very substantial. And when you compare that to Bitcoin, um, this is from my paper, the Unforgeable Costliness paper, and this is mapping out at, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 75, however many tickets the attacker has. And this actually does not include the cost to buy the tickets, right? This is purely for um, uh, the the amount of time, assuming you already own the tickets. So this assumes that an exchange goes rogue, they, you know, they, um, they are in cahoots with all the VSPs. Like if you have all the VSPs attacking the network, then you've got you know, 30, 40% of the tickets. So that, that doesn't even include the cost to buy the tickets. If you add that, um, you know, Bitcoin can uh, take a back seat. But you can see here, this is the equivalent cost line for Bitcoin. And at 15% of the tickets, you know, we're, we're competing directly, right? Decred competes very, very meaningfully um, with Bitcoin under even the most conservative circumstances. So the hybrid system is, is quite remarkable. And this kind of gives you a, a bit of a, a tool that you can basically move whatever the parameters you want to see um, to understand what it actually means in terms of dollars to attack. Um, and you can also, this is probably the most interesting part, you can change it from an internal to an external attack. Now, internal means that we have a bunch of miners that go rogue, right? They already want to reorg the chain, which means they've got the hash power already. Um, and it's obviously the weakest attack vector because it's removing honest hash and converting it to aggressive hash. If you want to see what the government wants to do, then you flick it over to external and now you've got a whole different ball game, right? We're talking about 225 million. Um, you're talking about very, very substantial sums to attack the chain. Um, and you can play around with all these features, but um, it, it, it's a very nifty tool. And, uh, you know, the mathematics checks out. I've run this thing a number of times and it's, uh, it's just probability, right? It's, it's what's the actual probability of uh, you, you getting the, the block mined and then also um, having the tickets to, to back it up. And if not, back to the drawing board, do your proof of work again, uh, you know, try again. So it's a, uh, it's a powerful tool and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not well understood, but once you kind of understand what this particular security curve, curve is as a share of tickets versus required hash power, um, as a multiple of the honest hash power, um, it's, a, it, it's a powerful little metric. Uh, let me just check and see if there's any questions coming in. If not, I'll, uh, I'll carry on. How do I check get questions? No, it doesn't matter. Um, so the, we have a question that I really, uh, 
We have a question from one of our participants here. What exactly causes the price to rise once the price falls below the proof of work USD line? The proof Good of question. work USD line also seems to act like a support level. Yes, uh, hang on, let me find, where's my chart? I've confused myself, here we are. So what you're basically saying is why, what is actually the mechanism as to why it falls below proof of work? Do we actually get a rebound? Now, let me take off difficulty just to clean things up a little bit. Now, the interesting thing is actually that you can print this same chart for, in fact, let's do it because the easiest way is to actually see this thing. Uh, sorry, give me a second. Um, the reason that you actually can run these models and it has significance, um, so this is for priced in BTC, right? So if we just quickly jump back to where we were with our difficulty ribbon. So you miners think about costs in US dollar denominated terms, right? So their US dollar income um, is, is US dollar based and their income is in DCR, right? So their costs are in USD, income is in DCR. Now, as the exchange rate drops, obviously, if they've still got the same US dollar denominated costs in power and rent and, and staffing and machine costs and all that kind of stuff, maintenance, um, they need to sell more coins, which increases sell pressure. So the lower price goes, the more the sell pressure um, uh, increases. Now, that is only through to a point. Let's bring our difficulty back. And this is why difficulty is very important. Difficulty captures all of that in, in one metric. Now, when it fall, when, when the line falls below the total rewards paid for US dollars, it's basically saying that we're no longer getting the cash flow to support the mining hardware. Because if you remember that miners are long-term thinkers, they're not thinking about the price today. They're thinking about what could it be? What happens if, if Decred goes to $50, $100, $10, $5? What does our business model look like under all of these potential price extremes? So the, mine, the, the reason the cumulative line works is because they've already projected, they've thought about this long-term feasibility um, of what the what-if scenario, right? So they would already have a lot of these models built into their financial um, position. So when we see, you know, again, it, it never, that, nothing's going to be perfectly exact except for difficulty. That's kind of the distillation of all of this in real time. Um, because we know that, you know, what they got paid back here is obviously different to what they get paid here. So why take the cumulative? Well, because they're long-term thinkers, right? They've already mapped out all of these scenarios. So they would have prices of DCR where they know as soon as it drops below X dollars, it's going to become more expensive for us to operate than to keep going. So we're going to have to turn off 5, 10, 15. The reason that this metric work is because miners are long-term thinkers, right? They've already mapped out a lot of price scenarios of what happens if Decred goes to $50, $12, $1, right? What if it caves in? What if it goes to $10,000? They've mapped out all of these scenarios. So this, this cumulative reward line is think about it like what would the miner have projected forward? What is their feasibility to keep running their systems? So when this whole thing dips below that price, it means that we're basically dipping below a miner's um, uh, estimated cost models. And that's why we see the difficulty starts to curl down um, because it means that miners are slowly turning off their machines. Now, if one guy is turning off five, 10% of his machines and the other guy keeps spinning, then he's gaining hash share. So he can sell less coins to cover his US dollar costs, right? By turning off machines, you're reducing your US dollar costs, but your income could very well remain the same, right? Um, uh, if, you know, if price starts moving up or down, it will, it will, it's obviously a quite a dynamic market, but um, the difficulty adjustment is always bringing the puzzle down that they have to mine to solve the blocks to get easier and easier or harder and harder depending on how many people are mining. So it's a self equalizing system. That's actually why this whole thing works um, because it's a self equalizing system. It's always trying to find the mean and return to equilibrium. So that's really why these lines um, do actually have significance because it's kind of the minus forward projected models. And if we actually look at the uh, hang on, I think I have it here. Where is it? Here we are. Um, so you can see here, so miners are US dollar thinking. Investors, more or less, are probably BTC thinking at this point in time. It remains the reserve asset of the space. Now, you can actually see here that the mining line, the proof of the, the, the US dollar denominated line, sure, it acted in resistance a little bit here. It acted as a little bit of resistance, but not really, right? Maybe a bit of resistance here. But you can clearly see that the US dollar line has much less significance 
for the BTC pricing. However, proof of stake, very significant, obvious support level, right? This is um, stakers thinking about their return on investment in BTC terms, right? So it's interesting to actually see that we're getting this change. Who the stakeholder is that we're mapping out their stress level um, is actually dependent on their cost basis, right? So that's that's kind of why these lines work because it's it's thinking about people's cost basis. What are the, what is their kind of um, their their buy-in point? Where are they actually going to be underwater, and where does their investment no longer make sense? Whether it's in ASIC hardware or mining or or, um, or just investing in staking in the coin, right? So um, I hope that kind of answers the question as to why these particular block subsidy lines work, um, or sorry, at least appear to work. They have um, you know historical fractals that suggest that there's some kind of significance. Um, again, a lot of these things are kind of variable with time, but um, and we're still trying to work these out. And I'm really excited to see the next cycle play out to see whether we, we actually get a repeat of these lines. Um, because you know, so far they've, they've actually reacted fairly, uh, fairly strong in those fronts. Um, so the last thing I kind of want to go through is um, the paper that I released today. And this is on the realized cap MVRV ratio and gradient oscillators. Um, so the general gist of this is for anyone who's been around for a couple of years, I think 2017 is when CoinMetrics released the realized cap. Now, the problem with the market cap of all these crypto assets is it prices, for example, Satoshi's coins at the exact same price as the coins you and I are buying. Now, those coins haven't moved. So are they really economically, are they active in the system? Are they lost? What, if, what about coins that are lost? Should we be considering those in the market cap? Not really. And what happens if you get a coin that, you know, pumps up to, you know, $10,000 and then falls back down in a pump and dump scam? Does that actually mean that the market cap has gone up that much? Not really. That's just exchange-based noise, right? That's illiquidity and um, probably some, um, some market manipulation, stuff like that. So the market cap is kind of subject to all of these constraints and making it actually a pretty crappy metric for tracking. Um, uh, tracking behavior like that. What the realized cap does, um, and actually you can see here, this is a, um, a probability chart for Bitcoin, where it's saying that coins, um, this is a bar chart of every transaction that's ever happened on Bitcoin. And it's saying of all of the spent coins, how many of them were less than a year, less than one hour old, um, between one hour and one day, between one day and one week. So it's kind of the age of the coin when it was spent, right? Or the age of the UTXO. And you can clearly see that, you know, most coins move within a week when they last moved, right? Maybe a month. Once you start talking about, you know, um, one month, three months, six months, this is hodler territory. It's a very small number of the transactions, right? They normally only show up at uh, market tops, right? We don't see a lot of these things move very often. Um, and it kind of supports the store of value narrative. So what the realized cap does is it says, okay, this coin at five years, five to seven years, whenever you moved, if your price was $100, you're going to stay priced at $100. And this guy here that moved at one hour, you're going to be priced at $9,920, right? And when you move again, you'll be repriced at $9,960. So it's kind of pricing every coin at the time when it last moved on chain, which for a store of value network like Bitcoin, where coins don't move very often, makes a lot of sense, right? Satoshi's coins down here are priced at zero because they haven't moved. They're not really economically meaningful. Um, and the trader's coin that he moved um, between exchanges is meaningful and therefore is priced at the current rate. Now, if Satoshi ever moved his coins, let's say he moved a million coins, they're going to get repriced from zero to $9,920. And you're going to get this enormous repricing um, and that's what we see in, in Bitcoin market cycles is during bull markets, all the ages and ages ago, they start moving their coins to sell them. So during these blow off tops, you get a massive repricing, right? You get these vertical vertical sections of the, uh, the realized cap as coins are repriced at the new level. Um, during a bear market, not many people are using the coins. So they just, you know, they, they sit either in wallets or they sit on exchanges and most of the trading is going on off chain. So there's no repricing because the, you know, we don't know about it on chain. Um, and then during a capitulation event, people are basically selling the coins they bought up here at a lower price, right? And other people, the smart money are accumulating. So one guy's capitulation is another guy's accumulation. So 
the smart money is buying coins that people are going, oh my God, I can't see the price going any lower. I'm out. They, they send their coins to an exchange. It now registers. They bought it at 20,000. It now re-registers itself at 3,000. And some smart money walks in and goes, great, give me all of those bags and I'm going to withdraw them. So we get a repricing down, but that's actually an accumulation phase. So it's, it goes both ways. That's the behavior that we see for, for Bitcoin at least. Um, and you know you can create these oscillators, the MVRV ratio is just the ratio between the two, and you can see these blow off tops and historical uh, probability. Now we know for, for Decred, that it's actually a different model because coins are always moving on chain, and when you've got um, strong hand holders, um, they're actually moving coins all the time, right? In in the proof of stake network, so. You know, here's just a handful of different actions and the uh, the market psychology that, that kind of sits by them. When you're withdrawing or you're buying a ticket or you're mixing because you want to mix, that's actually your support level, right? You are deliberately saying, I am not selling my coins. I'm actually going to hold on to them, stake them or mix them, right? And there's any other number, you know, just send them or whatever you do. Conversely, there's the other side of the scale, which is, I want to anonymize my coins before I sell them. Um, after this ticket votes, I'm sick of decred. I hate this governance system. I'm going to sell and exit. Or I'm, you know, it's now hit my cost basis and I need to exit, right? Because I don't want to lose, lose US dollar or BTC, whatever your denomination is. So there's a, there's a scale of um, deliberate actions. Every time somebody touches their DCR coins, they're making a deliberate choice to either sell them or not sell them. And unlike Bitcoin, those coins for strong hands do not sit there doing nothing, right? They're constantly moving. So the realized cap for Decred actually follows the market cap a lot more and it goes up and down, right? It goes in both directions. It's a lot smoother. Um, and the MVRV ratio is very interesting in that for Bitcoin, we kind of saw that you get, you know, a generational top and then a generational bottom. And then you wait four years, you get a generational top, you get a generational bottom. You get like five, six signals in the entirety of Bitcoin's life. For Decred, very, very different. What we see is that the during a bull market, the realized cap actually acts as a support level. So every time the MVRV ratio, meaning the market cap equals the realized cap is equal to one, it's a support level, right? And you can see this one, two, three, four, five, break below, break above, support, and then it finally breaks below. And you can see this in the MVRV, breaks below, retests, and then we're into the bear market. And you can see that through the bull market, it remained entirely or almost entirely above one. And in the bear market, we've been entirely below one. So every time it comes and tests it from below or from above, that's another signal, right? So Decred has a lot more signals coming out of realized cap and MVRV ratio. And it kind of is that psychological mean, right? When was the last time everybody touched their coins? Um, and that's really what's important. Uh, and you can see this here. So during uh, bull markets, you're getting these support levels in the green markets. You can see we had this descending triangle that basically broke down. So it actually works some technical analysis as well. Um, and during points in time when lots of people want decred, lots of people want a stake, um, miners are hanging on to coins and you know all sorts of stuff's going on on chain. Um, there's lots of activity. You get this steep repricing similar to what we had for Bitcoin, right? Lots of people are buying in, withdrawing, mixing, whatever. Um, you get steep repricing. And conversely, when people are just capitulating and other big people are accumulating, you get a massive reduction, right? The, the realized cap really sinks quite low. So it goes in both directions. Um, and when we add in their transaction volume, you can see in particular during all these capitulation events, high spikes, in volume, right? Um, greater than average. And I like how much volume we're seeing of late. This is all on chain. This is not trading volume. These are people moving coins on chain, split into mix in red, um, tickets in green, and then regular in, when regular is really what you want to look at, because that's people accumulating or capitulating, right? One of the two. Um, so I, I like what I'm seeing in, uh, in recent times. Um, I might leave the probability side of things, but you can basically use a similar histogram on how likely something is to occur um, to, again, pick um, extreme values. So just like you have your um, uh, support and resistance at a value of one, um, you've also got extreme values like you do for Bitcoin. So you can see that the decred MVR signal to time ratio than Bitcoin does, um, simply because coins are always moving on chain. It's got a lot more on-chain activity, uh, which is good to see.
Um, so the final kind of element of this paper was looking at some indicators. So if we just jump back up here and we look at, um, so for those who are mathematically minded, the gradient is basically the slope of this blue line or period. So it's basically saying that during this period over here, we've obviously got a negative sloping um, gradient. Both of these metrics are pointing down. We've got a downtrend. So the gradient over a 28 day period is probably gonna be negative. And during this period here, it's gonna be positive and actually quite steep, right? The steeper it is, the more coins are moving on chain, the more bullish or in a downtrend, bearish the whole market is, right? Now, market cap, we said, moves a lot faster than the realized cap. There's a lot more um, coins moving. Um, uh, sorry, the, the price will move a lot more in the market cap because it's subject to exchange and sentiment and trading algos and derivatives and all that fun stuff um, compared to the, the realized cap, which is much slower, right? You need people to actually unstake their coins. They need to initiate the transaction. Deposits take time. Withdrawals take time it's a slower metric right so the sentiment occurring on an exchange where people are going that's it i'm exiting get me out of here is much faster to react than the um oh okay now i, I don't like where the market's going let me wait for my coin to unstake right there it is okay let me now send the transaction wait five confirmations or whatever it is then i'm going to sell it right it's a much slower process so you'll see changes in sentiment on exchange before you'll see it on chain but likewise, you will see large scale momentum shifts happen on chain before you see it, um, you know, big accumulation events, things like that. You'll see that before you see it in the price because the smart money is not just going to fat finger and hit buy. They're going to slowly accumulate at low prices and withdraw over time. Right. So you'll see on chain shift the momentum before the, the big scale momentum before you see it on uh, exchanges. So what these uh, these two metrics do is it basically looks at those gradients, right? And it says, okay, um, if we look at the 28 day gradient, 28 days being the average ticket vote time and the 142 day, the much longer um, vote time, that's when all tickets have occurred, right? Every single ticket has voted or expired. Um, you can start to look at when you've got a positive gradient, it means things are in an uptrend or it's bullish, it means that coins that were spent low at last moved lower are being respent at higher prices. And conversely in a downtrend, Coins that last moved at ten dollars are now moving at eight dollars, right? Um, and the actual the height the actual height of these these um, gradient lines is how steep it is, right? The steeper it is, right? If we're looking at something like this guy here, very steep, very bullish, right? Shallow, less bullish, right? You've got less coins moving on chain, and likewise to the downside, the steeper it is to the downside. Um, this, you know, this is to the downside, the steeper it is to the downside, the more negative. And you can see that over time, some of these are, um, are closing in. So we'll kind of touch on that. Um, so the 28 day metric is a fast, noisy, right? 28 days is not a long period, um, but it's much faster. And whenever you get this purple line, which is kind of the difference between those two gradients, whenever it breaks below zero from the top, it's actually a topping signal, right? Look at all these red points. It pretty much picks exactly on the point when you wanted to be exiting, right? You would have picked all of these, these little rallies. And conversely, when it breaks to the upside from the underside, what a great entry every single one of these green lines would have been, right? You would have picked every capitulation and every major top just by looking at this particular metric. And the reason this works is because the momentum on exchange shifts faster and moves, cracks below zero and, and reverses course before the realized um, cap does. So it's looking at that, when does, when does off chain, when is it faster and moving and momentum and sentiment shifting before it appears on chain. And for the longer term 142 day metric, it's actually the opposite. What we're seeing here is a, you know, through this market cycle, we got an increased amount of bullish behavior. We got this second rally, right? During the midst of the bear market, we actually got a massive rally in decred, right? And you could see this on chain. Look at this massive momentum that's building up, right? Because it's a, um, a divergence in this direction, it's actually a continuation. You went from somewhat steep to massively steep, right, on a relative basis. And conversely, from a, during this bear market, um, which is kind of back here, I think this was about uh, August or something in uh, 2018, um, we're getting this, um, this divergence. So basically this means that this is super bearish, right? Super steep, everyone wants to just exit, get out of this market, right, real bad. 
as we've gone along this bear market, the amount of sell pressure has reduced and reduced and reduced. And we're getting this massive momentum divergence. Or it, it, this is, to me, this feels like a, a reversal signal combined with really, really significant on-chain volume. I was actually really surprised by the level, just how much edge you can get out of these things. Um, it, it, it actually shocked me. Um, but to be honest, it, when you actually distill the psychology and why the realized cap is actually more, I would say more important for, for Decred than Bitcoin, because it follows, it follows the last time that every single person touched their coins. And because Decred is a on-chain centric um, blockchain network, that has a lot more signal. Then coins are just going to sit in a hodler's wallet and then they sell it two, three, four years later, right? Or never. Um, so there's a lot more going on on chain and these metrics have, uh, to be honest, I was surprised at how, uh, how poignant they were in, in picking that up. So um, what I'm really excited to do, so you, you, you might have seen that the, uh, the proposal to get this website spun up um, has passed. So the team is cracking on with, uh, with building that site. Um, I'm really excited to get some of these things up and uh, I think this is going to be one of the metrics that I, I try to get up. Um, as quickly as I can, because I think there's a lot of really exciting stuff and uh, an edge you can find using these um, these metrics. But uh, yeah, look, hopefully that's kind of a, a bit of an overview. You know, there's, there's an infinite amount of stuff you can talk about with uh, with on chain and just understanding uh, what these networks are doing. Um, but hopefully that's a bit of a, a fly through, particularly of this recent paper um, and how you can actually apply and think about um, these particular metrics. So hopefully people find it uh, useful over time. Yeah, and I, I feel like you may have covered this question in this paper, um, but I will ask it just in case we want to go over it again. Um, a participant at, uh, has asked, not sure where this fits in, but from late January 2020, the 24 hour volume went overnight from roughly 5 million to 50 to 100 million plus. What might have caused this? Is this exchange, if this is exchange volume? Um, I'm going to hazard a guess that some uh, wash trading joke of an exchange has just started um, trading back and forward. So um, in terms of looking at exchange volume, the only place that I will look for exchange volume is going to be um, Masari on their um, on-chain screener, I think on-chain FX, I think it's called. Um, coin market cap is just so bad when it comes to exchange data. You, you really shouldn't be using that for um, getting anything uh, anything important or something that you want to hang your hat on or make a decision based on. You definitely don't want to be using coin market cap. You want to be using um, uh, a Masari's tool because they will actually distill out what they call the real volume. So there's obviously a, there's a lot more dodgy exchanges than there are legit exchanges and they distill out the legit uh, on, um, exchange flows. So that's really what you want to be basing your attention on. I'd be very surprised if that was, uh, that was real. Um, in terms of on-chain volume, uh, in terms of the actual, I think this is actually correct to scale. So we're seeing roughly 5 million DCR moving. This is daily, right? So some of these candles are getting up to about 5 million um, DCR moving. Uh, I think it's 5 million. Yeah, it is. Um, in total volume um, on, a, on a daily basis. Now, a lot of this is coming from mixes. Some of these regular transactions, um, so remember that we, sometimes when you're buying a ticket, it will have a regular transaction and then it will be a ticket, right? So it has to combine a bunch of UTXOs um, and then buy the ticket. So some of these are actually technically double counting. Um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind and why we're getting, you know, 5 million coins moving on chain. But you can see on a relative basis uh, that that's actually what's, what, what is going on uh, on the network. So, you know, that's, that's a pretty bullish, uh, bullish signal. Well, combining the information you've provided um, with the on-chain activity and, you know, that trend line moving up uh, for the momentum divergence reversal, what was the, what was the acronym for that? MV, was it MDVR? No, so um, uh, the MVRV is the ratio we saw before, which is basically just the ratio between market cap and realized cap. Um, the, these guys here uh, don't really have an acronym. Um, Basically, what we're looking at is the change in slope of the gradient. So the higher these peaks are, the steeper the angle of attack for the, um, the, the, the gradient of these two different metrics is. Now, what the purple line is, it, it actually works a lot better for the 28 day. The purple line is the difference between those two. So you can see here that the realized gradient is in pink. 
Um, and that's this, you know, that's the gradient of the realized cap over 28 days. And the market cap is in blue, which you can see is a lot noisier, right? It, it varies based on all sorts of random price signals. The purple is taking the difference between the two. And the reason you take the difference is it's basically saying, when does the market cap reverse harder and faster than the realized? When is the exchange volume shifting momentum before the, um, the, the realized, the on-chain behavior is? So that's why when this thing crosses zero, it's basically saying that market is either getting bearish before on-chain or bullish before on-chain if it's coming from below. Um, and with this oscillator, it's basically just a much slower 142-day long-term, right? Um, if anything's going on long-term, it's going to show up in 142 days. So it's a very slow-moving metric, but that also means that your signals are slower, but it's higher conviction. When you get a signal, it's, it means something. So if we suddenly see a huge bend, right? We see everything curl down and we just dump to $3, um, you know, then obviously this, uh, this particular thing has been a false signal. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that it's broken, but it just means that the market's doing what it does. Um, but on the long-term basis, this is telling me that this bear market, in my gut feel, is playing or played its course. And when we combine that with the fact that the miners, where are they? Where are our miners? Um, our miners in difficulty are also starting to um, turn their machines back on. That means that their books, right, their cash flow books um, are looking more positive. Now, the really cool thing about um, the way DCR performs is not only due to miners, but also with the treasury, um, Decred actually does benefit from Bitcoin, right? Just the same the way that I, I do believe that long-term Bitcoin will benefit from Decred. Um, the more that the Bitcoin price goes up and the more attention that it brings, the miners, right, can sell less because everything is, you know, BTC to USD. So Decred actually gets a, you know, it does ride on the coattails on that front, which is a positive. And same for the treasury, right? The treasury will gain US dollar value as Bitcoin rallies, right? So, you know, um, there is a mutual benefit, benefit there. And I do believe that Decred technology will um, improve Bitcoin long term. Um, Bitcoiners don't like to admit it, but I do believe that long term, things like the mixer, things like Lightning, the DEX, um, and even the privacy mix, uh, I think will be uh, valid methods for uh, for Bitcoin to to improve and deal with a fairly challenging environment that I think is coming for, uh, for these government disrupting uh, technologies. Um, but overall, I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of things. We're seeing it break above the proof of work line, positive. It's now retesting the, the realized cap um, again, which I think it's probably going to break through this time. It's certainly uh, giving it a, a good test. We're seeing miners in, uh, in a more positive um, position um, in terms of the difficulty. Um, and then we're also seeing this massive divergence, which is telling on volume, which is telling us that in general, decred holders are willing to s stick by this thing and they're, uh, we've weathered the storm. So uh, that's, that's kind of my general overview of where we're at at the moment and, and why these things are kind of lining up the way they are. Well, we've certainly got, we've got the Planet Decred proposal that's passed. The DEX, Dex is, 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 is being tested. Um, you know, it's, there's tutorials now to easily run your own private node. Um, so thing is coming into the uh, Decrediton. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, now we've got another question uh, in regards to contractors. I assume most are part time right now. Do you see more going full time as a bull run in shoes? I'm wondering your opinion on the application of quality work metric exploding with a treasury that quantifies significantly. It's a little absolutely. Off. I mean, I 100% I, I believe that the treasury, the treasury is the beating heart of this network, right? Um, it will scale with dollar value. And the more dollar value goes in, the more attraction this network brings in, the more attraction, the more devs, the more devs, the more full time, the more the treasury can support them, like the whole thing. And then you get, you know, think about this self-reinforcing uh, proposition. I think I even talked about this way back in my first um, Decred in Depth podcast. This is one of the things that brought me into the network um, is the, the, the amount of self-reinforcing reality that Decred has going for it. Um, you know, the more contractors it has building good work, the more value. I mean, Decred has built such an incredible amount of technology in the bear market, right, on really strapped funds. Um, yes, the, the treasury funds are limited in DCR terms, but they're unlimited in US dollar terms. Obviously not practically, there's limits to everything, but, you know, the upside of that is, is enormous. So I do believe that more full-time contractors will be coming on. I think that the more attention it gets, 
Um, and we're actually seeing a lot of things unraveling around this industry, right? You've got, you've got a few ways to fund systems. You either have vulture capitalists that basically um, uh, build rent into the system and, uh, and, and direct things in their way, which, you know, the ethos of this project has never been down that path. Um, you've got um, uh, donations, which good luck building a lot with that. You've got gifting of time, which, you know, is really what Bitcoin has relied on. But when you look at the governance model of Bitcoin, who has the mental energy to work their bone, to work to the bone, to build the technology, understand it, get it right, get it through all the levels of review and all that kind of stuff to then, how do you reach consensus again? What do you Twitter poll? So you've got to go through this whole process and a lot of good ideas are never going to happen. And people are eventually going to get apathetic and go, oh, you know what? I just, why would I bother? I may as well go and get funding somewhere else. Um, because people, you know, people do good work. They should be paid for it. Right. This is, this is the reality of the world. And if you don't want to pay for it, then you're not going to get good work. Um, and I think Decred really solved that in a very innovative way in that it can bootstrap itself, um, both from a development side, a marketing side, a community side, all of these things you can you can do because it's self-sovereign. And, um, you know, it scales with U.S. dollar value, which arguably can move wherever it wants to go. So um, I'm very excited with where it's going. And yes, I do believe that more full time and attention will come. Um, with scale and that again becomes self-reinforcing that's a great answer you, you sort of encompass quite a lot of the good points there and i have to say i agree with you um, I'm, I'm quite excited uh, for what's happening with decred in the space in large well if there's no other questions um we'll call it a day uh once again this has been recorded so we'll get uh, hopefully exodus to edit this up for us and uh we will be able to publish it so we can review it a lot of information there hope some of you took notes um oh we've yeah, got one other question beauty recording. what's the Would biggest risk say... to move forward <laughs> yep go for it um it's a very good question um and my my honest opinion is the only thing stopping decred right now is attention now, liquidity and all that kind of stuff, that's, it's, yes, liquidity is very important and it will, I do believe that it will come with time. What it actually needs is people yelling about it, right? That's honestly the only thing Decred's missing. Um, I'm really excited and, you know, Exodus has been building some really, really clever ideas in terms of, you know, grassroots marketing and, and, and strategies. The only thing holding Decred back, in my honest opinion, is people coming up with creative ways to shout about it. Um, the more people know about this thing and the more customers that these exchanges see um, really, really do want to be dollar cost averaging, want to be investing, understand the tech, want to get involved. There's a huge amount of people sitting on the sidelines just waiting for that, you know, liquidity, quote unquote. Um, more people come out with creative ways to just shout about it is all this thing needs because once you get that level of attention, um, the fundamentals speak for themselves, right? And, you know, we're seeing that the the core holders of DCR that exist at the moment, they're hardcore, man. They've they've dealt with severe financial challenges. Um, you know, they're not selling at $10. They're not selling at $20, right? These people are here for the long haul. And, you know, the stuff that Richard Regis did is confirming that. So um, I think Decred has some of the strongest holders in the entire network. And, you know, I'm going to say it outright. I think the Decred hodlers are not priced in in any way, shape or form, but they will be. So that's where I honestly believe that the core strength of this thing is, is in the people that um, understand it. And I think all it needs is people talking about it. I think that's the only thing that's missing. And the only thing holding it back is, uh, is creative ways of spreading the word. And on the note of creative ways of spreading the word, uh, last night we had a planning session um, with some social sciences academics. And so in a couple of weeks time, hopefully, we're gonna run another virtual event uh, discussing the social sciences impact of Decred, um, the future of work, governance systems, the transparency of it all, uh, blockchain at large uh, and what it entails. So it's another way to get academics involved and people interested in this sort of topic. It's something that, you know, people were talking about in the early days of blockchain being a panacea for all of the world's ills, but we're going to talk about it a bit more seriously in a couple of weeks. Uh, stay tuned. We will announce it. Um, but yeah, looking forward to more stuff from you, Checkmate, as always. Um, thank you so much for all of your contributions daily that I'm seeing. And uh, thanks again for today. Um, look forward to the next one. What do you reckon we do this every, every month?
Yeah, I mean, I'm totally up for it. I mean, the reality is there's so much that you can go through. Um, you know, it, it gives me a reason to keep building up all these charts. And, you know, a, a lot of people say it's just voodoo magic, which I'm sure some of it is. But the reality is that there is psychology and there is um, there is genuine reasons why these things behave the way they do. Um, and, you know, what, what I love about the work that Nino and I are doing is is it's it's trying to you know, there's a lot of charts that I look at that are just complete garbage, right? They, they, they do absolutely nothing. Um, and what we try to present is the ones that are after a lot of trial and error and, and testing different theories and, and trying to unpick the psychology of the network. Um, and to be honest, it's Decred's triple supply side that makes it such a fascinating network because you've got supply from miners, stakers, contractors, and they, they all behave very differently, but they all normally cross one another, right? Their holders, their miners, and their stakers, or their contractors, stakers, and holders, right? You've got a whole lot of different people who are all looking at different things, and that supply side, the supply side of Decred, they are hardcore. So, um, you know, I like to explore these things. I think there's a lot of concepts and I honestly believe that on-chain is the edge that um, all casual people who look at this market um, should be paying attention to because price action will send you absolutely broke. This stuff, you just get the highest conviction signal and you just trade on probabilities, right? And you, it's, it's just so much more powerful for the casual sideline um, person who's just looking for tops and bottoms. You know, you're not overly fussed in all the noise. This is the kind of stuff that actually helps you get there. Right, and make better decisions. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. Understand the psychology, understand the fundamentals of the asset. Um, and the blockchain is telling you its fundamentals every single block. And on-chain just distills that down into a signal. So hopefully that's kind of the, uh, the message that everyone can kind of take away is that this is a tool for you to use to make decisions. And uh, we just got told that DCR went up 2% during this session. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with me. <laughs> Thank you uh, again, Checkmate, and thank you everyone who participated today. Uh, wonderful questions. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Happy to receive some feedback and uh, hopefully we get a nice edit of this from Exodus published soon. Uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, join us again um, and stay tuned for more. Thank you very much, guys. guys. Thank you. Decred is secure, adaptable, sustainable. Learn more at decred.org.